Cooley, an early microsociologist, holding a microscope up to individual interactions, he says that you learn who you are by the way others react to you. So you're not who you think you are or want to be. You're not who other people think you are necessarily, but you're who you think other people think you are. So maybe your mom and dad praise you and when you show them that picture of a doggy you drew they say oh that's a great doggy look at it it's so realistic like i think it's going to start barking at me oh i'm scared it's going to bite me and from that you're going to think yeah yeah mom and dad they 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 really like my doggy they really like my drawing i'm a great drawer i'm a great artist on the other hand if your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend um glares at you every time they see you or they or they look at you and then whisper to their friends and everyone laughs then you might think Oh, they, they hate me. I, I must be an asshole. Your self-image is built on how you think other people see you. You probably look at yourself in the mirror before you leave the house in the morning because you want to look good. And if you leave the house and you forget to look in the mirror and you, you catch someone giving you a strange look, you might ask yourself, how do I appear to them? And how are they maybe judging me? Is my hair standing up? Is that what they're seeing? And are they judging me and saying, oh, how sloppy? And in that case, d does that mean I'm a, I'm a sloppy person? I'm a slob? Am I ugly? Some experimenters tested this idea on Halloween night some years ago. They sent a bunch of kids out trick-or-treating to a bunch of empty houses. And at those houses, they left a bowl of candy. Now, before they went out, they asked the children their names and ages in order to remind the kids who they were, to bring to mind their own self-image. And half of the kids they told to take one piece of candy. Now on half of the porches, they placed a mirror, an actual physical mirror. Now looking glass self, looking glass just means mirror. And so they placed a physical mirror on the porches, half of the porches, where the kids could see themselves as they were taking the candy. The kids who weren't told how many pieces of candy to take, they took quite a bit. 75% of them took more than one. The kids who, um, under normal conditions, had been told to take only one piece of candy took only 34% uh, of them took the candy. However, when there was a mirror, no one was watching as far as they knew, but there was a mirror so they could see themselves and they could imagine what they would look like to other people. And under that condition, only 11% of children who had been told to take only one piece took a piece. And still 59% of children who hadn't been told how many pieces to take um, took multiple pieces. And yet, those same children who didn't see the mirror on the porch, many more of them still took the candy. So even when they hadn't been told how many pieces of candy to take, when they could see themselves in the mirror, they were much more likely to only take one piece. They imagined how they looked to other people and changed their behavior accordingly, not wanting to look like greedy or thieves or rule breakers. You probably went to your high school graduation. You walked across the stage, you wore a silly square hat, and uh, your parents and family all came, and they saw you, and they took pictures of you, and they said, congratulations. You went through that rite of passage, even though you could have just gotten the diploma in the mail. Because the rite of passage, and we have them for many different transitions in life, when you retire, when you become an adult, at e even your birthday, when you're accepted into a new job, for instance, um, those rites of passage are society holding up a mirror for you with congratulations written across the top. It's society showing you that, yes, we accept you into this new status. So Simba, one of the first thing he experiences in life is being held up for the whole savannah society to see. And they all bow down. And in that moment, he sees in the mirror of the people around him that he truly is a prince. He is someone special. He has the status of prince. Now, we have many statuses in life. Our status set is all of the positions that a person holds at any one time. Some of these are ascribed or scripted for us. We have no choice in the matter. You were, whether you were born a boy or a girl, was probably decided simply based on your biological sex. Um, your life stage, even though it's culturally determined, it's still generally judged by others upon you based on simply how you look, your biological age. 
And then there are statuses that we achieve for ourselves. So you work to become, say, an honor student. You try very hard to get that job. You get that job and you take on that achieved status of employee. And then there are social rules that you're expected to follow. So you show up on time, you wear that silly uniform, you do the job that you signed up for, and you also do whatever the boss says. You obey the boss. Those are all your roles, your behaviors when you're in that position of employee. So how do we learn the roles that are expected of a specific status? When interacting with a little boy or girl, it's been found that adults tend to change the way they talk and the way they behave based on their understanding of whether that child is a boy or a girl. And an experiment has been done in which the same child was dressed in little blue clothes or little pink clothes and called um, Sarah or Nathan. And they found that and adults interacted very, very different with the children, depending on, even with the same child, whether they thought they had the status of boy or girl. So what does it tell a child about themselves when you say, oh, you're a big, strong girl, boy, or what a cute little girl, aren't you beautiful? What does that tell you is important about yourself? Mead expanded on Cooley's idea of the looking glass self. Babies, again, start out very simple minds, simple understanding of who they are in relation to other people. And um, they just copy behavior with no real understanding of what they're doing, but they learn from the results of their actions. So even babies play little scientists and they learn about the world. But as they get older, they start to come to understand that they are a distinct person and other people have various statuses, but they have a very simple understanding of those statuses. From the people who are closest to them, they come to recognize significant others. And a significant other isn't just your boyfriend or girlfriend or husband or wife. It's anyone that takes on a significant personal role in helping to develop your personality. A person who, who holds up a very special mirror through who you see a significant image of yourself. So if mommy um, gets mad at you, as a little kid, you might think, I'm a bad person, mommy doesn't like me. And that's crushing to you, probably, because that, that mommy is a very important person to you. And you start to take on those simple statuses that you see. You see that m mommy is a, a woman, and maybe if you're a girl, then you recognize that, that you're going to be a woman. And so you might start taking on the role of mommy. And, and playing at the things that you've seen mommy doing. Simba has various significant others, his mother and father, of course, Mufasa and Sarabi, and his friend Nala. But for Mufasa, perhaps because Simba recognizes him as a, a man lion and himself as a boy lion, he takes on a very special role. And, and he, he loves his father, and when his father is happy with him, he feels great about himself. But when his father lectures him, he feels so small, he feels crushed, he feels like nothing, and he, he's angry at himself, not at his father for being mad, but he's angry at himself because he sees in his father's reaction his own flaws. And he takes on the role of his father. He wants to put on his father's mane, he wants to be his father, dress like his father, act like his father. And so you see his personality of, of toughness and bravery. You, you see where he learns that. But Mead said, as we go on in childhood, we start to develop a more complex understanding of the people around us. We start to understand that it's not just mommy or daddy who have a specific feeling about us and who we can judge ourselves based on, but that other people in general have certain expectations of us and feel a certain way about us. So we start to see a generalized other of society as a whole and their norms and expectations. We start to understand that people can have many statuses, and so um, he calls it the game stage, because at this point we can start playing more complex games, not just playing make-believe, taking on the role of one person, but playing, say, soccer and understanding that not only am, is my role to get the ball into the other goal, but that I have teammates who share that goal with me, and that I have a goalie who's going to protect my goal, and that there's another team full of people who are my opposition, and I have to get past them in order to complete my own role of getting the ball in the hole. So we understand that others have multiple statuses and that we can have multiple statuses. And our self becomes divided in a sense, according to Mead. Society shapes me 
but I can still make choices on my own. So we see that Simba, when his society bows down to him, he sees that his mom, mother and father as significant others, they're important, and they feel a certain way about him, and of course he wants them to think well of him, but he also sees that society in general sees him as prince. And there we see the other aspects of his personality start to develop, his cockiness, his arrogance. Now, we've talked about gender, but how do ascribe, other ascribed statuses affect our sense of ourselves in the way that others treat us? Well, W.E.B. Du Bois said, Du Bois, I'm sorry, said, African Americans have a double consciousness. They have two self-images. One, as Americans, they're raised in this country that tells them you're free to pursue the American dream, that anything is open to you, that you know the world is your oyster, and all you have to do is put in the effort, and you can become rich or famous or successful. And yet they also see that they are Negroes, as he would have said, second-class citizens with limited opportunities. And that ascribed status changes that American dream and the life chances available. And he says, it's a peculiar sensation, a particular sensation, this double consciousness, always measuring yourself by a world, by a generalized other that looks on in amused contempt and pity, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro. So next time, we're going to look at some of how we learn about who we are outside of our family. Um, how do we learn about our own self-image and the statuses that we hold as they are seen by the wider society through school, through mass media, through our peer groups.